Lost Property, Chapter 11. Okay, now something quite important happens in this chapter because really this is a moment in which Josh starts to, to grow up, starts to mature. He comes down in the morning, Dad has already gone to the office, Mum's taken Hayley for, for swimming, and then has to um, pick her up again. And as he notices Mum, she took a sip from her cup and then says to Josh, do you want a coffee, Josh? No, 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 just this, he replies. He's in a hurry. He's on his mind. There's only one thing that he's thinking of, and that is getting to the auction and seeing Clive lose all the possessions in that suitcase and him winning. So that's the only thing that, that's quite on his mind. But Mum starts to talk about, you know, the fact that you two had to talk about Michael. And then she starts to apologise and, you know, that she, you know, the way she reacted, etc., Josh isn't really particularly listening to her. He's not particularly interested. Um, he's just doing his own thing and trying to, 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 go, to go quickly. She then talks about the bangle that uh, Joanne, um, uh, her sister, gave her and then how they, they saw Phil play, etc. Um, had he been able to perhaps notice Mum, I guess is the way I would put it, because his mind's on something else, but if he had noticed mum, he might have noticed that she's seemingly down, feeling blue, feeling down, feeling depressed. And the fact that she's talking about these things and bringing all this up from the past um, <clears throat> would certainly indicate that. But the only thing Josh can think of is hurry up to get out. Now, if you notice um, on this page here, 133, which is about page 99 in your novel, there are words here in italics. Again, Exactly the same as with Alicia, the words in italics. This is not what he is saying verbally. This is only what he is thinking. So if I just read the beginning of that paragraph. Mum drained her cup and played with it between her hands, barely noticing what she was doing. And this is what he, Josh thinks. Please, Mum, no more of the old stories I'd heard a hundred times. Not now. I've got to get going. Okay. But Mum continues, obviously, continues talking. And then she goes on to say, Father McHugh says it can take two years to get over the death of someone close to you. Then after a pause, she said, Michael's been gone more than two years. Um, the important thing here is that when there is a death of, of somebody, so somebody dies, there is a closure. You know, the person has died, you go to the funeral, and that's where a funeral, I guess, becomes very, very important. Um, you know, what the body is, you know, where the person's buried. There's a closure. So as you leave the cemetery, you sort of, I guess, start entering a new life and you, and you try, it's your first steps into a new way of living, I think is the way I can perhaps describe it. But in this case here, there is no closure. Um, he's obviously alive, Michael's alive because he calls, but... Nobody knows where he is. Is he okay? What's wrong? Why? There's a lot of whys. And it's those whys that are going to be niggling at mum and the not knowing, etc. So having a missing person in that case, like Michael here, is quite um, devastating for the family. But Josh does sort of say, look, he's not dead, mum. No, no, of course not, she agreed quickly. More silence. The memories seemed spent. I moved cautiously to the dishwasher, my mind already jumping ahead, calculating how fast I would have to run to make the train. Then Mum spoke again. Do you want a cup of coffee, Josh? What was this obsession with coffee? She'd already asked me once. OK, so Josh is being quite, you know, very much the typical teenager. Like, what the, what's going on? Why have you asked me once? Why do you have to ask me again for? Coffee, coffee. I don't want coffee. He then goes on to say... I started to refuse until the sight of her body huddled listlessly at the kitchen table choked off the words in my throat. The house would be empty once I left. Empty except for mum. And she wasn't quite here this morning. Not all of her. Hadn't been for months. Okay, so this idea of why the coffee, why the coffee changes his perception when he actually looks at mum and he notices what we would call non-verbal communication. He notices 
the way she sat, the way she had her head down, shoulders hunched, etc. It's telling him so much about her mental state here. Mum's depressed and we see that through this chapter. And as he says, she hasn't been you know, quite herself for months. So this has been building up for, for quite a while and she's been feeling worse every day. And you know, this is slowly sort of coming to, to the head. So what does Josh do? Yeah, Mum, I'll have a coffee. Do you want another one yourself? Now, this is a really important part of the novel. This is where Josh matures. This is where he kind of learns to read that, you know, nonverbal communication as, as well as the tone of a person um, in what they're saying. is sort of becoming a little bit of a Clive, as Clive was when that woman came in with the brooch. And, um, and that's important because it's not the coffee. He's finally realised it's not the coffee that mum wanted. It's the conversation. And when you think about it, adults, when they usually go out, meet up with, with their friends, sure, they'll, you know, they'll have a coffee, they'll have a tea or a drink. But it's not really the, the drink that's important. What is important is the fact that they gather together and have a conversation. And that coffee, that tea, it's just a, a, way, of, you know, a way of getting together. Um, in a sense okay so she stayed home he stayed home with her for a while obviously let her have her say and then mum drops him off at the station he finally gets into the auction however it was already over he goes into the door into the uh, into the premises anyway and looks around the shelves the benches you know crowded with junk only yesterday that were laid bare um, and then he goes further down. Amid the echoes, it was easy to spot Mr Whitworth, who stood with a female assistant. Both of them focused intently on a clipboard. I waited until the young woman moved away, then took her place at his side. My luck was holding up because he recognised my face. How did it go? I asked. Ah, fair result. Can't complain, he signed, hitching up his pants beneath his enormous punch and paunch and, and flicking the, the, the clipboard with his forefinger. If you're looking for Clive, he's gone upstairs. I'll see him Monday, I, I suppose. Actually, I was interested in how those last few things sold. Yeah, the, the stuff from the suitcase. Here, see for yourself, he offered, handing me the clipboard. The assistant was back with two glasses of water, passing one to Mr Whitworth and gulping the other one herself. No wonder, because it was stifling in here. I worked quickly before Mr Whitworth took back the clipboard. It held page after page of lists. Starting with the lot number on the left-hand side, there was a wide column under the heading Item Description, then two much narrower columns beside Bidder's Number and Sale Price. And we're up to about page 103 in your books. First page started with cameras, switched to jewellery, etc. After the jewellery came electrical goods, etc. So he'd kept looking through this clipboard, um, Mr Whitworth, until the last page finished off with real junk, the odds and ends. This time I did recognise items from the suitcase, the very last ones sold. Lot 369, five pens, two ballpoints, three fountain, various brands. Uh, number 79, sold $15. Lot 370, leather bound Bible, number 79, $5. Lot 371, tubes of oil paint in box, number 79, $12. And uh, lot 372, music box, antique, Austrian, number 79, sold for $65. The final column showed the price, and a quick calculation in my head said they had brought less, less than $100 in total. Without the jewellery to, you know, to add in this seemed a pathetic amount of money. Why would Clive want to steal these things anyway, when apart from the music box, they were practically worthless. Coming here today was supposed to be a victory. I'd wanted to see all the things Clive was holding back for himself go under the hammer and the money end up in proper hands. When I finally looked at what he was hoarding, reduced to words on a page, my stomach twisted. There was something going on here 
that I hadn't seen. So originally, Josh thought that Clive was going to take all these items, sell them, steal them, sell them and make thousands of dollars, lots and lots of money. But when it actually ends up in the auction, $100 for all of that is really not much at all. The uneasiness made me study the list more closely. That was when I saw number 79 entered in one of the columns for all the items from the suitcase. Mr Whitworth, I asked. He had sent the young woman for another glass of water, but turned his head now to hear my question. This column bitter's number, what does it mean? He swivelled right around to face me. Tells us who bought each item. We use numbers instead of names to speed things up. See that card? He pointed three metres away to a bright orange square of thin cardboard that had been trampled onto the floor. It was about 20 centimetres long each side, but despite the grubby shoe prints, I could make out a large black number in the centre, 133. All bidders have to register, and we give them a card like that with a number. So if these four things on the end of the list have the same number, then they were all bought by the same person. He took the clipboard from my hand and glanced at where I was holding back to the top pages to keep the last page exposed. Yep, dead right. In fact, I can even tell you who the number 79 was. You know him, of course. I guessed before he said the name, Clive Staples. Whiz, oh, is, was, Josh confused? I would quite imagine so because this is the thief right, who stole all those items and was going to go out the back of a pub somewhere and sell them and make lots and lots of money. Okay, so let's, let's work with that supposition. So that was the premise. But then why, after having all those items taken back from him, from the thief's possession, right, put into the auction and sold. Why does the supposed thief, a.k.a. Clive Staples, why then does he go to the auction? I suppose he had to be there, part of his job maybe, or maybe not. Why does this supposed thief go to the auction and bid on these items and pay his own money to purchase those items back. I'm going to leave you with um, that question as we finish this chapter. <laughs>